So the Center for Law and Social Policy is a national nonprofit organization, 40 years old or plus, um, and we provide technical assistance on an array of low-income family issues, which you can see um, include uh, such issues as childcare, early education, all the way through to post-secondary education and success, uh, job creation, uh, uh, temporary and shared jobs, uh, so a whole range of issues. And we bridge policy and practice, we bridge state and federal, we bridge um, government officials and advocacy organizations. We've tracked government initiatives largely at the state level related to uh, poverty initiatives, task forces, and issued a set a series of reports. That didn't mean we had to talk, had not been spending a lot of time talking to cities. And in fact, we're partially blamed for these uh, very powerful women being up here today. So you have a lot to uh, look forward to uh, in hearing their stories. <coughs> Center for Law and Social Policy also manages an initiative called uh, Spotlight on Poverty and Opportunity, the source for news ideas and action. And what we do there is we aggregate all the news on poverty from around the country. We also have original content, such as commentaries from both sides of the aisle tackling different issues related to poverty and opportunity. We've had Speaker Pelosi, former Speaker Gingrich, um, everybody under the sun uh, offering their views on disparate issues related to poverty and opportunity. It's a way to really reach across the country um, with ideas that are new that you've got, um, activities that you've got underway. So I hope that all of you will see Spotlight on Poverty and Opportunity as a platform for yourself um, for getting the word out about your activities. We have a state page which posts everything that's happening in states. You could potentially have a commentary. We have about 18,000 Twitter followers. We had a million hits last year. So again, um, I, I encourage you to think about uh, reaching out, giving me a call, and I actually left in my backpack, and so I'll circulate it right afterwards, a sign-up sheet if you want to get um, our <coughs> weekly e-newsletter that summarizes all of these developments around the country. Um, so the, the focus of our discussion this morning is uh, taking a comprehensive approach. And we're, I'm going to look broadly at the why, how, and which of taking a comprehensive approach. But before we do that, I think the first issue is what is a comprehensive approach? And well, for me, a comprehensive approach to tackling poverty opportunity is really a call for stepping back and taking a fresh look at what's happening in the community and the context in which people who are experiencing poverty are experiencing poverty. To me, it is not necessarily about doing all of what needs to be done all at once. First of all, you don't have the resources, and probably it doesn't make sense. But it is about conveying and framing the issue of poverty in a comprehensive way so that your citizenry understands what the dynamics of the issue and will roll with you as you move forward over time in the parts that make sense when they make sense. Now for cities, poverty's always been an issue and it's increasingly the case. The new census data shows that uh, in 54 big cities, that's defined as over 100,000 or higher, at least a quarter of the population in 2012 was living in poverty. Um, now part of that is the recession, but part of that as well is the new economy. You know, I think uh, one reason for taking a comprehensive look and assessment is that it isn't your grandmother or your mother's poverty anymore. And I think that it's central to understanding that many people don't know what you know. Um, people are feeling the poverty that's around, they're feeling the low income scenario that's around, but they don't really grasp it. And there's a very new picture of poverty. One of the big virtues of stepping back and thinking through this initiative, I will love to hear, you'll hear more from the other panelists, and it would be great to hear from your own experiences, is that it gives you the time and the space, which is very precious, to pull together new thoughts and ideas about this new economy and how poverty has changed. We form our ideas of poverty from images, this is an image from 1964 when the War on Poverty was launched. And this is a photo that appeared in Life magazine. It was Appalachian. <coughs> the truth is that some people today still live um, in this kind of a picture. Um, 
But since our overall standard of living has generally increased, the irony is that poverty, the look of poverty, has really changed and consequently, in a way, become even more invisible. This is the new poverty, the poverty is today, and what this is is a recent photo, uh, an image of 700 people standing outside of Walmart to try and get one of 65 jobs. The poor are often workers, and you all know that, um, but the public, really, when they still hear the word poor, they assume that the poor are not workers, that they have no experience in the workplace. Um, but what we see here is that over two-thirds of children who are poor live with at least one worker, and nearly one-third live with a worker who's working full-time year-round. Um, the data show from focus groups and some polling that the word working poor doesn't sink in to people. For this very reason, we kind of hold on to our old ideas. It's really challenging to get people to hear working poor. There's something dissonant going on in absorbing that concept. It's almost like you have to separate them. You have to say, the poor who are working to make people actually hear the whole construct. One of the reasons that there is a new poverty is that wages have stagnated dramatically. Um, this doesn't show the drama as much, but it shows that in the lower percentiles, the stagnation is even greater than the stagnation in the higher percentiles. This is just another way of cutting that same picture. And what this shows is that the productivity, which is going up, is the uh, top line. You know, our national productivity has grown dramatically. The green is, in fact, median wages. And those have stagnated since the 70s. So the workers who are fueling the energy and uh, who are fuel fueling the economy are in fact not getting any good share of that growth in GDP. This is a pretty dramatic story, especially if you're a wonk and especially this early in the morning. So um, in the new poverty, in addition to the fact that folks are working and that wages have stagnated, jobs have changed. And how have jobs changed? Jobs are often too often low wage and often inadequate in the number of hours that they offer. You know, you think people get a job, they get a job, it's a stepping stone, it's just going to bring you ahead. Well, what's happening in the low wage economy, which you know well because you're tasting it and feeling it at the local level, is that too often people have to package together one or more jobs <coughs> that are part time, and this is a really enormous challenge. The growth in involuntary part time work is enormous in this nation. And what that means is people who want more hours, just looking at that uh, metric, we now have about 8 million involuntary part-time workers in the nation. And that is double the number since 2007. Now, again, part of that is the recovery from the recession. But part of it is now believed to be structural, that we are going to be facing increasingly this involuntary part-time work. And there's been a dramatic increase in temporary work. Um, while temporary workers only account for, and these are the folks who work for these temp firms, while temporary workers account for only about 2% of the overall workforce, they accounted for 15% of the growth in new jobs. That's pretty significant. And there's a uh, piece in one of the newsletters that tracks city developments that reports that in a set of cities, like Birmingham, nobody said Birmingham here, right? Uh, you know, the percentage attributable to temporary jobs was 66% in Birmingham. Um, and, and Arizona, Tucson, 37%. Significant numbers. And the observation of the group that did the analysis was that um, in the last recession, um, strong cities went after temporary jobs. In this recession, they're saying, Weaker cities are, got, are finding themselves experiencing temporary jobs, and they are not morphing into permanent jobs in the way that one would hope. So um, the story is that we have this new picture of poverty, and it's important to drill it down into your own numbers um, and uh, have that opportunity to spend time to pull it together. What's also key is if you're going to have an initiative, no matter what point you're in, 
you always have a generic set of things that you need to think through and move forward on. Um, and I'll call those the five T's because we figured that out here. We got the totality, the table, the timeline, transparency, and tasks. And if I look at Len, I'm sure he'll come up with a few more T's. And if I were smart enough, I would have had them be the 10 T's or the three T's to keep on with the teaming, but I didn't. Um, so the first thing is um, that you'll hear from Eva and Suzanne all about their process and learn from their tips and their experience. But these generic items are what they've worked through in their own way um, and what need to be addressed on an ongoing basis. First, the question of totality. If you start out asking the big, broad question of uh, what does poverty and opportunity look like in my community today, you'll probably be pulling together a picture in a comprehensive way that hasn't been drawn for a long time. So the real question becomes, what totality are we going to tackle? Are we going to tackle all of poverty, or are we going to somehow slice and dice it a bit? Are we instead going to say, we're going to tackle extreme poverty? Um, for example, the state of Illinois created legislation that set a target for cutting extreme poverty in half um, in their state. Extreme poverty is those who live at 50% of the poverty level. You could decide you wanted to slice at a group being those who are workers and who are poor. Or you could say child poverty or youth poverty, or you could say this part of the city. The other is who do you bring to the table? And you all know well how critical this question is. Your credibility in terms of the recommendations that come out and the action steps you take depend, about, depend upon who you bring to the table for this conversation. And it's not just once, it's in an ongoing way, different opportunities along the initiative's lifespan. Now, as you're thinking about who to bring to the table at these different points along the lifespan of the initiative, there are a set of obvious people. You want a breadth of agency people, you want a breadth of community people. But what often gets overlooked too much is a, a couple of uh, groups. One is the folks who are not the most experienced with poverty. They are often overlooked in thinking through strategy, thinking through priorities. In Richmond, nobody's here from Richmond today? Um, in, in Richmond, uh, the mayor has uh, a poverty initiative, and the recommendations that he first got from a group that was brought to the table was that the next time there was dinner being set, there needed to be a citizen's advisory task force and one has now been created, and its mission is to monitor the progress of the activities underway through the mayor's initiative. And the Citizens Advisory Task Force is composed in majority of people who have had experience with poverty. Um, the other group that often everybody understands needs to be at the table, but sometimes don't invest enough energy in, is the business community. Um, and if you think it's a good idea to have a business community at your table, um, you probably will be in a jealous rage when you hear from Savannah uh, about their uh, history with respect to the business community. You are blessed if you're in a community with a highly regarded business person who's just retired. Um, maybe you might mention that. But there's also another group that um, I realized I've been remiss in concentrating on, and that's the scientists. I think a new part of the picture as well um, is the uh, brain research that is out there that demonstrates that what happens to folks in poverty, and particularly children, influences the brain circuitry. So that we now have evidence that the physical connections that make our brain work are influenced by the experience of stress. What does that mean? We've always known that it's hard for kids who are growing up poor to function well and do well in school. Now we have a scientific biological explanation of function. What this tells us is that when the kid enters pre-K, the kid's already got a lot to overcome that no parent, no teacher has the ready ability if the kid is still living in the stress that poverty creates that makes those synapses not provide the executive functioning 
and short-term memory issues that you need to succeed. So we're investing in other things like pre-K and great programs when that investment is handicapped by the very existence of the poverty that they're in and we know it's having this physical and then <coughs> developmental influence. So I would bring to the table your neuroscientists, your most favorite neuroscientists <laughs> over there. You know, the person who never thought that policy was in her bailiwick or his bailiwick, get that person aboard. And it also will do well to get your leading pediatrician aboard. The American Academy of Pediatrics at the national level has declared that poverty, addressing poverty in a comprehensive way, is what it's about in the next coming years. And the new president, Dr. Perrin, is very passionate about that. So you might have this very interesting science uh, angle, and I think it could make a difference, again, at different points in the life of your program and your initiative. Timeline, very key. When states first came out and announced uh, in the mid-2000s this rash of policy recommendations at the state level, they often came out with a set of recommendations. And it was everything under the sun. And what quickly became learned in that process was that time matters. And the recommendations should come with timeline. What should we be doing first? What's short term? What's midterm? What's long term? Um, and let's just have a few of them. Because minds can't wrap themselves around too many things. Um, and the public can't either. So if we're going to keep track of things, let's make it a manageable Right. The other T is transparency, and this is also something you all grapple with in a variety of ways, but transparency is the key for accountability. If you don't have transparency, you can't address accountability. And transparency means you know, getting up everything on the web in a way that folks can understand, but it also means having metrics that matter and metrics that people can understand and follow. And this is important because you want the media coverage, you want the pressure of the public, you want that kind of ongoing tension. One way to create the tension for yourself, but that's very understandable for the public, is to set a poverty target, to say you're going to cut poverty in half. Um, the reason for doing that is it's understandable, people can see it, and you can use it if you start from the very beginning, explaining that this is a tool that shows us how much progress we're making, and if we're not making progress, why not? It is a hook, not to be afraid of, but a hook for explaining to the public and other policymakers um, what you're confronting. Now the large question for everybody is what tasks, which solutions? Um, and uh, each city's context is unique, and um, you're going to hear some stories about which solutions were picked or are being picked in different places. Um, overall, stepping back for cities, um, there's some generic questions to consider as well, which are cost, control, and innovation. There is no single right answer about what's the best and the first solution for a particular city to follow. Namely, because in one city, something that hasn't been tried has been underway for a decade, let's say. Um, and I'm just going to uh, run through a few ideas, though, and toss them into the pot here. But overall, stepping back again, it's safe to say that reducing poverty is a no-brainer. The poverty level for family of four is around roughly $24,000. If someone's at roughly $24,000 plus one, they're out of poverty. That's not going to solve the problem, but we know how to do it. I mean, if you gave people that money, they'd be out of poverty. The problem is that they live and grow in places and spaces with services that also need to be out of poverty. Um, and their families are already tr struggling with problems that they need to cure in order to make the next generation go on. So um, in terms of some <coughs> low-hanging fruit ideas, um, just really quickly, I think it's critical to um, protect those wages that are stagnated. And there are a set of um, activities in that area that I think are really sort of oriented towards city. And that includes wage enforcement. Now, you may not control wage enforcement, but you are close to the workers who may not know they have a right 
to get overtime and to begin that process of supporting those low-wage workers because otherwise they're on your door for a whole other set of services. So it's a cost-effective way of enabling that other funding stream, not government, but the private sector, they're the success story, will protect those wages. Payday lending is another area where cities have been in the lead and states have been in the lead in changing some of those rules. Just protecting those earnings and financial literacy, again, is a, uh, an area that a lot of cities have already been in the lead in and there are a lot of new tips and uh, strategies around financial benefits. Maximizing public benefits is getting a lot of attention and the reason is that in a set of areas, a lot of the public that are eligible for benefits aren't getting them. 35% of eligible parents do not receive Medicaid. You know, their kids are getting chipped, but the existing Medicaid program, we're talking about before the Affordable Care Act, and 35% of eligible working families do not receive SNAP. This is your turf, your strategies for figuring out how to get and maximize those benefits, and we'll be hearing more about that. From the, uh, in promoting the employer role here, there are a lot of low cost, low hanging fruit ways um, for, for you to proceed. Not no cost, a no cost in the political sense, but no cost to your state, city budget. For example, yesterday, I, how many of you were at the panel that included the review of uh, Jersey City's uh, paid sick days? Yeah, okay, so very vital for the workers, you heard that. It uh, doesn't cost the city much to implement this rule, and it's a reasonable thing to ask employers to do, at least in my humble opinion. In San Francisco, um, there is a new task force that has been created to look at scheduling issues because this is what's really challenging for low-wage workers is they get told the day before they're supposed to show up, show up. And if you don't show up, you may lose the wages or you may lose the job. And that happens a lot. So we need to protect those who have jobs through these kinds of, of strategies. Um, it would be great if each of the mayors had a, an award for high road employers. That was the mayor's award for high road employers who work with low wage workers. There are awards like that at the national level, but at the city level, it would be great fun. And the way I think it would be particularly fun is if we did the American Idol way. Um, you know, like bring the employers together, have them have a face off and have the audience get to, you know, rate and rank and hear what they have to say. I'm not very serious about that, but it would be fun if anybody wanted to try it um, to, to, to work on that. You like that idea? We're going to run with that one? I would like to do it. He likes to bring you a And do you like it for him too? <laughs> you do too, okay. Well, you're in. Um, what, what city are we going to for this face off? Apparently Mountain View, California. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All right. We'll see you in Mountain View uh, 12 months from now. <laughs> Excellent. Mountain View's on. So as you know, cities are, are important laboratories for uh, program and policy solutions. Uh, but you have this challenge. You know, you don't uh, control all the funding streams. And you don't control all of the rules. Um, but you do have a lot of influence and a lot of experience with that. I just want to cite one. Um, a big challenge that is getting more and more attention, and I don't know how many of you are addressing this, is in the public benefits arena. And it's called the cliff effect. Anybody dealing with the cliff effect? So what do I mean by the cliff effect? That means that if I'm getting a bunch of uh, benefits, like food stamps, maybe a child care subsidy, if my earnings get to a certain point, I get a new job, let's say, or I get a, a, a promotion at my job. That next dollar reduces my benefits potentially significantly, or I even fall off the cliff and I lose my child care subsidy. This is driving Republicans nuts and Democrats nuts, and to the point where we have, lo and behold, in this Congress, a bipartisan bill to step up and look at this question in a significant way because if we're trying to help low-income people uh, do an effective tax rate of 85 to 100 percent at a certain point in the trajectory of jobs sets them back and it makes this big question mark of how can I survive they want to survive but there's this like valley or is that yeah there's like this hole it's like a donut in any event 
to leap over, it needs to be a smoother transition, not a cliff effect. And so there's this bipartisan bill. The bill is to study this question and come up with smart ideas for how to do it. You all, at the city level, are closer to the stories, closer to the experience. Why not have a parallel effort at the city level, in a bipartisan way, to explore the implications for your low wage and poor workers of the cliff effect? Get your ideas together for solutions and the stories that are, have emerged. Push them on your state, because your state controls some of the decision making there themselves. And often, here's the trick, often your state thinks it's following a rule it doesn't have any flexibility about, but actually the federal legislation enables it to have some flexibility in its decision making related to this. So use your influence in this arena and it would help us all. So the other idea about solutions, and this is more about um, psychology, is pick your innovation. And by that I mean it's hard to sustain an interest in fighting poverty, period. But over the long haul, and that's what it's going to take, you need to be constantly goosing the ideas and goosing the commitment all along. It helps to repackage old ideas. It helps to rip off of old ideas but find some way of communicating and assessing what works that's new. And I know you heard about some of these uh, yesterday, so I'm not going to go into them. I know you heard about social impact bonds. Is, is Utah here, Salt Lake City? Hey, hi. Hi. Uh, single EITC in New York City is trying to address getting uh, childless individuals, uh, a pilot program giving them uh, the same kind of support that those with families get. Um, and uh, one other area is in workforce, again, Richmond. Richmond's recent proposals that the mayor has just decided to run with, workforce is an old issue. They have an existing program. What they decided to do is make their workforce effort be a two-generation approach, which is to say, instead of just being in the business of helping somebody get a job, they're going to be at the agency level in the business of helping the family while they're helping the person get and stay in the job. So it's, it's twinning the needs of all the members of the family with the focus of the workforce agency, which has traditionally been um, just on the worker. So this is a new and innovative kind of thing. So I want to just close by saying these were stepping back kinds of questions that are ongoing in the life of any initiative. You will hear more from these stellar women about what they've been accomplishing in, in their cities. Um, but I also want to say the time is really right for pushing out this focus. Not only is this the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty, and we're going to get a lot of attention throughout this year, um, but when the president speaks at the State of the Union about inequality and reinforces how he's completely focused on that, it assures again another year or two of lots of attention on inequality and mobility and you really are sitting on the folks who are at issue. Those folks who are not having the American dream of being able to have a job which is a stepping stone to making work pay over a lifetime to a better life for their children. And then finally, there's some evidence that public opinion is changing, that people are recognizing that it's not the fault of people that they don't have a job that is taking them out of poverty, that is partially and significantly um, the world of work which is failing us, the world of jobs which is failing us. And we have public evidence that the public supports a strategies to cut poverty in half. So I want to turn um, to my colleagues and, and thank you very much.